Honorable Senator Pelican Prescott, President of the United Nations Association of Bengal and Tobago, the members and the office leaders of the UN Association here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank uh, Senator Prescott for his very generous remarks and also for inviting me to address his gathering this afternoon. I feel honored and privileged that he has been in front of this distinguished gathering. And I profoundly thank you, sir, for uh, doing so. Now, he has also given me a topic on which I should be speaking. So, the topic he gave me was how India captivated the West. I did not question the topic, I presume that India captivated the West. That's how I proceed. <laughs> if you have any doubts, we can discuss that later. <laughs> but let me also thank some of my distinguished colleagues uh, and Sandinai in international relations here in the UV and the Giovanni, my colleague from Aguero, and some of the other colleagues from the High Commission and Thank you very much. So let's start uh, our discussion on the topic which I have been given to speak today. Now, how do you captivate, captivate people or country or civilize? It's a very big question. <coughs> Do you get captivate them through economic power? Economic power really matters. Like for example, US, China, they are emerging economic powers. They, they, they can captivate any country. Scientific developments, mathematics. But we also have some of the other things, yoga, music, Ayurveda, gastronomy, spiritual power. So what actually captivated the West? This is the question which I will try to answer slowly uh, slowly. Let me first say that why did Christopher Columbus went to discover India? He, he started on a long unknown voyage, very dangerous one, to discover India by sea. And that was because he thought that there is something there, something really he admired, something which captivated him, that's why he went there. And he was followed by many others. Of course, the Vasco da Gama finally discovered India. But all of us came to this part of the world. And that is why old people living in this part of the world were old Indians. Very strangely, but that's how the name Indians originated. Because all of us thought that these are the this is India, and these are the inhabitants of India. Now, that's it. Uh, this is not showing here, but it's there is a title under this, this is Sakta Nail Jaiti. It is very important part of this emblem of India. It comes from the third century history in a, a tower which is still existing in the central part of India, which was erected by Sivar Ashok. And under this written Sakta Nail Jaiti. Sakta Nail Jaiti means truth always prevails. And I will come back to that later on. And this is what Napoleon said. I am just quoting him precisely what he said. The sword and the spirit, what is the part between the two? He said, in the end, it is the spirit which prevails. Now, if we look at some ancient civilizations in the world, Egypt was one of the very ancient civilizations, continues to remain. But if you look at Egypt and China, I have taken two examples here. They have not been able to maintain what they were in the past. They were transformed, they were catapulted with the new developments in their country. For example, Egypt, they started with art, great civilization, 3500 BC, even more than that. And when the Greeks came, the, the pharaohs completely disappeared, and the Greeks took over. They, were, they, were, they became completely Greeks. And then the Romans came and the Romans took over. The, the, the Greeks disappeared and the Pharaohs disappeared. And then came the Christianity. Christianity took over, the Romans disappeared, the Greeks disappeared, and the Pharaohs disappeared. And then came the Islam and the, everything else disappeared. The remnants remain, but not as living civilization anywhere. 
why that happened? This is this is a question in an ancient question, civilized. Then if we look at China, for example, they had Tao, a, a great writer, great philosopher, great you know environment man, environment. And then he was Confucian came and he took over and changed the entire thing. Taking then Buddhism came and Buddhism took over in different ways. And then the communism came and communism took over. The old civilization did disappear. But in India it did not happen. In India it did not happen. We still have the same ancient civilization which existed. There have been certain additions in substructures here and there, but the frame remains intact. And why it is so? This is why I'll come back to this. You see the economic part rises and comes down. There was a time when some never sat on the British Empire. Now the British is not the same place. The Americans were at the top some years ago. Now the China is rising and they're having a competition between the two of them. Of them. We don't know what would happen in US power after 20, 30 years from today. We need some predictions. The economic power rises and goes down. But there are certain fundamentals of the society which remain intact if those are right. And that is where I started with Sakta Vajayate because the truth always prevails. Whatever is fundamental, it always stays. Now let me explain what do we mean by fundamentals. We have an ocean, for example. It's filled with water. Now that water of the ocean is the fundamental. But the waves on it which comes and goes and they violently come and go and sometimes rise high, sometimes low. That is what we call the changes that happen from day to day from time to time. So the fundamental of the ocean will disappear if the water disappears. Then it will not be borders. And the waves will have no place at all. But as long as it is filled with water, the fundamentals are there. The same applies to the human being. We all have a body, we have five senses, we talk, we listen, we see, we feel hungry, we feel sleepy, and we feel thirsty. We have these fundamentals in human body. And then our knowledge change, our thinking change our religion changes, our place changes, those are the things which change from time to time. But so long as the fundamentals are right, then you can sustain a civilization. And that is how India remains an intact because the fundamentals of Indian basis, Indian foundation, were found to be true to all time. Now, what are those fundamentals? The fundamentals of Indian civilization, as I can see, are the Vedic knowledge, the Vedic science. In that, the first thing I would like to clarify is that Veda means knowledge. The, the actual meaning of Ved means knowledge. Wisdom, another word. And it also says that you should not accept anything blindly by faith. You should not accept anything only because somebody is saying you should be able to test that knowledge to your own satisfaction. Once you find it is right, then you accept it. And that is what the Vedic knowledge says. And actually, the Vedic knowledge does not propound any religion. It only tells you the science of life, the science of this universe. And that science had remained valid thousands of years back in time, is valid today, and that is what, in my view, has captivated the rest. And will continue to captivate the rest. At the end of my presentation, I'll show you some of the famous quotes by some very famous people. Now, this is a Sanskrit sloka here. Poon madaya, poon milam, poon naat, poon mudachyate, poon nashya, poon madaya, poon mira vishishya. I'll explain to you in a little while. But first, the Indian, what I call it, Vedic science or spirituality, it first traveled actually to the east, not to the west. Come on. It came, it came 
first to the Southeast Asian region. It went to neighborhood in India, in Cambodia, to Myanmar, to the Philippines, to Malaysia, to Indonesia, that part of the world was affected first. There was a golden period of Indian civilization, we call it from my 7th century BC to approximately 3rd, 4th century AD. During that period, there was a very famous king called Ashoka the Great, and he, after winning a war, he saw a lot of violence. He said, This is not the way. And he decided to resort to non violence, and he took to Buddhism, because he thought Buddhism was the most non violent religion. And he sent his first emissary to Southeast Asia with this message of Vedic knowledge. And they were absolutely captivated by this knowledge, and this remains actually the foundation of entire Southeast Asia even today. I tell you how. I was posted to Philippines between 2001 and 2003. That time the Philippines government was hosting a, a, a summit of the ASEAN leaders, and they wanted to stage a cultural program which is open to all ASEAN countries. And you know what they found? They found a play based on Ramayana. They could not find anything else which is common to them. And this is what it speaks about the Indian spiritual uh, knowledge to that part of the world. But since from there the knowledge also went to the Central Asia, you have seen in Afghanistan and a uh, lot of Central Asian part of the world, the Buddhism went from India and the civilizations changed. And then it came to the West. Now, coming to the West is more recent. I would say it is more in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And from Vivekananda was one of the first ones who came uh, to this part of the world to explain the message of Vedanta. And then, of course, we had Mahatma Gandhi uh, captivated the, the West, and of course, Nelson Mandela, who was uh, a great admirer of Mahatma Gandhi, who came forward in other parts. Now, why? Vedic knowledge is so fundamental, so important, and so important that Indian civilization has survived till today before the time. Now all of us, whether we are from the East, from the West, from Islam, from Christianity, from Hinduism, any religion in the world, all of us sometime in our life we think who we are, what is this universe? The millions of the stars. You sit down on the rooftop in the night and you see thousands of stars. The moon shining, vast and finite space. Then you see gold, the ocean side, huge ocean. And you see the, you know, the big stone, you know, what about this volcanic eruptions? What is this universe? What is this nature? Who created this? These questions are right in our mind. Sometime or other. Who am I? What is my relation with the rest of the humanity? What is my relation with the, with the nature? So these are the questions which have been answered directly in a very simple language in the Vedic writings. And therefore, I would like to address a little bit on some of these questions to explain for how India was able to captivate the rest and how India continues to captivate. So, who created this universe? Who runs these systems? You know? The sun rises beside you and it has its, uh, what you call, it rotates on its axis. The earth rotates and earth also revolves. The planets revolve. And it so precision that never ever they collide. We can precisely predict the time of the solar eclipse. How did you sense? Do not have how did you sense? How did you sense? Who does this sense? Who created these various forms of life? You see, every form of life is a very special place. You can accept how it works, and be how it works, and end how it works. You go and see the sea life in the ocean, how it works. You can appreciate it. 
emergency one. You more than jump on every seat. One hundred and three months. Each one has very specific emergencies. Very, very different policies. One of them is your mind. Each one has a different specific characteristic. It's all sort of friend. It's drunk is different. It's evil and different. It's flowers are different. It's fruit of course is different. You analyze any part of any two plants will be totally different. How would that characteristic How various forms of life and who created the human being? Who created the You are so evolved in you are such a great mind. Our mind is the one which has created an aircraft, which has created submarines, which has created uh, robots, which has created missiles, which can create higher identities. Look at this. Now, go into a little bit of the detail of the creation and how the human writings answer this question. I have read a little bit from many scriptures around the world. I did not find such direct and lucid and correct answers as I could find in the designs on the creation, running of this universe, and the humankind and the other species of life. Now, give me a few minutes just to explain one of the fundamentals. The first fundamental is that everything comes from one single source and then it starts multiplying in what we call diverse positions. So the entire diversity comes from unity. This is one single principle. If you look at our own family, man and woman, they create five children and those are all different. If you take a piece of wood, you can create thousand different variations of that the wood. You can create a window, you can create a lectern, you can create a table, you can create a door, you can create a roof, you can create a door. It depends how you do it. You take a boat of clay, out of that same clay you can create millions different variations. Or you take the cotton, you can create out of that cotton all the variations of clothes which are there. So the diversity comes out of unity. This is one principle which we must understand to understand the very science. The second principle is nothing can be created without consciousness. Consciousness is the fundamental to all things. For example, this microphone here cannot create anything because it doesn't have consciousness. This lectern cannot create anything because it doesn't have consciousness. But you can create something, you can draw, you can create a house, you can create a repair, you can throw an agricultural tree, you can create meat, you can plant trees, you can create anything because you have consciousness. But once that consciousness is gone, the man is dead. You cannot create anything. He just goes away. He has nothing to do. The higher the consciousness, the more you can create. Animals also have consciousness, but they don't have consciousness. Therefore, they call it is infinitive. The higher it goes, the highest is in the man, human being. And we are the biggest creator at the time. So these two principles to understand the creation first. But modern science has grown in a different direction. Modern science, starting from Galileo and later on, many of the scientists have come. They have also tried to analyze the creation, how it happened. But if they, if their matter is different. Their matter is physical matter. That you go and see certain things, you observe them, you report their behavior, and then you analyze and come to a conclusion. For example, you observe the artist's movement, and you say, our work is like this. And then you try to understand the moon, and you try to understand other planets, you try to understand other stars, and that's how you try to understand the universe. That is the way modern science has been going about. So they became, they, they believe that the physical group you can discover everything. Now imagine the billions of the stars in this universe. As per the modern science itself, there are 
the, 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 the size of the known universe is 76 billion light years. That is the size of the universe. It has what they call at least 400 billion galaxies. Each galaxy having millions of stars and planets. So how do you go and examine that infinite truth? How many stars, how many planets can you examine? So far, we have not been able to even certain on the number of planets in the solar system. We forget about other planets. They, they used to be seven and then eight and then nine and then again came down to eight. We are not even sure about that. I give this example very often that we can't even count the air of the human body. How can we understand the planets and the stars which are in this infinite expanse? You need, even if you have a life of a million years, you cannot experiment with all those uh, stars and planets and galaxies and understand the system. Even in this life of 100 years, if you start examining five plants, I think you may not be able to understand even their uh, mystery of their creation of five plants. So they came out with Big Bang Theory. They said that there was a small cosmos of energy at some time, and somehow it exploded. They don't know how, but somehow it exploded. And it started expanding, expanding, and then the stars were created and galaxies were created. This is what the science has been teaching. So I asked them where this cosmos came from, who created this cosmos, how it exploded, and how these properties came that the sun is shining and the stars are shining, but the earth is not shining, and the moon is having phases, and you know, all these properties, how did they came? They have no answer to that. When they came with the theory of uh, evolution, Charles Darwin said, oh no, we were not humans. We were apes before, then we became humans gradually. So, <laughs> he came with the theory to support a single cell organism, became multi cell, and then they became more complex, and then they became more complex. And that's how the, uh, the evolution of the species of life took. Now, if that is the kind of situation, I simply ask one question, who created the first cell? There is no answer to that. Because the cell has its properties to multiply, how that property comes into cell? From where? Who gave that property? Somebody gave that property to that cell. If you think that we are a combination of chemicals, then you put those chemicals in a lab and you can create a human being. Can you create that? We have reached such an advanced state in, in science, but we till today we don't know whether a man was created first or a woman was created first, whether an egg was created first or chicken was created first. Do we know till date? Despite all the advances we have made, but we have reached answers in the very guidance. And I just started with two fundamentals. Let me go further down how it is. This is very important point. The power of sense perception is limited. We believe in sense perception. Science believes in sense perception because all the observations are based on sense perception. If you cannot see something, you don't believe it. That's what science is. If you can't hear, you cannot believe that something. So sense perception is what? Perception to our five senses. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, and what we touch, these are the perceptions. So all the experience we get of the physical world outside through the senses. But are these senses reliable? That is the question. You see, there is a small child sitting here. Her sense perception of things is very different than my senses. When I was young, my perception was different, totally different. So should I take that perception right or this perception right? When I become another 10 years older, my perception will change. Which is the right perception, I don't know. The man's perception is different from the thing, and woman's perception is right. Which one is right? How do you know which is right? Perception by senses is only an approximation of reality. It is not reality. The same thing, the same city looks different in the morning time, in the afternoon time, and evening time, night time, looks totally different. The same sound could look to music in a particular mood, and another mood it looked like a noise in one of the world. The 
same perception, same ears. So the, your mental frame would decide whether you like it or not. So it can change. And moreover, one must know who gives power to your senses. That is the big question. How are you able to see? How are you able to smell? How are you able to hear? Who gives that power to you? How that power came in? There has to be something in it or something in the power. So this is one thing which science must understand that perception and sensing is not a reality, it's only an approximation of the reality. And they can never give you right results. And that is why scientific theories have been changing every 20, 30 years. There was a time when they thought that, you know, Earth was the center of the solar system and sun was revolving around it and then it changed the other way around. They also thought that the whole solar system in only 6,000 years ago. Now they think it is 4.3 billion years ago. You see, the changes are so dramatic in their own theories. Because the sense perception is undeniable. We have you imagine, you know, you and your spouse live together all of your life. You don't understand each other. Sometimes you have taken completely apart. Now that is the sense of substance. Isn't it true? You don't understand your own son who lives with you all the time. Own daughter. This is the sense of substance. So how can you understand, uh, you know, the sun and the millions of the stars and, you know, where is this your life? So these are the senses of perception. Now I was telling you that perception of a child would be very different than a perception of somebody else. Distance matters. With a distance, you can have a different perception. With cold, you can have a totally different perception. With darkness, you have a different perception of things. With all these changes. So this is, we must understand that sense perception cannot be the basis of understanding that. It can only give an idea of it, not the real. Then, as I was telling the other day, that this, every every uh, object or every existent in this universe becomes insensible as it becomes more powerful. It becomes insensible as it becomes more powerful. How? Let me just give you one example of this. I will take a very simple example of food. Food is very important for us to live. We eat food. It's visible, it's sensible, you can smell it, you can touch it, it's sensible. But without food you can live for two months, some people can live for more than that. Without water, what is more subtle than food? It is also sensible but more subtle. But how many days can you live without water? Let me find it, let me say it now. You got about air which is becoming more and more subtle now. It's becoming, or existence become more and more powerful, it becomes insensible. And I'd like to give you an example of insensible uh, in our, our own body for example. Sleep. Now sleep comes to us from there. Can you touch sleep? Can you see it? Can you hear it? It comes and this whole body collapses completely. You don't know what happens. It takes you away. It comes from nowhere, but it takes you away. We are so proud of our body, we can do this and we can fight bars and we can be argued and then we put us completely in this country. You see the power of insensitivity. Even mind in our body is insensitive. You can feel there's a mind, but you can't see it. It's insensitive. And the mind is the one which keeps controlling you all the time. The body is not that powerful as mind. I don't want to go into these details right now, but I'll just explain the example of time. Now time is a thing which we talk about. Everybody talks about time every single night. Time is governing our lives since birth till death. Our, when we get up, when we sleep, when we eat, when we come for a meeting, when we go for a work, and when we talk, everything is determined by time. And where is this time? Can anybody show me where this time? Can anybody touch it? Can anybody smell it? Can anybody taste it? You see, this is an insensible time. 
which controls every single sensible object in this universe. Every single sensible object. This building is controlled by time, with time it will collapse and it will be destroyed. Our body with time it will be destroyed, it will, will die. Uh, the human planet, earth will be destroyed with time. Even sun will be destroyed with time. It controls everything. It defines our life. If I say I'm 56 years old, what is that? That is nothing but insensible. Become so powerful. Now how do you experiment with insensible in laboratory? You tell me. Can you do that? It's not possible. So now let me this was I will give you the example of it, how one thing can become multiple. Now, what is the Vedic explanation to these questions? The Vedic explanation is very simple and let me give you in a very simple language in 10 minutes and then I'll finish. Because since you're looking at me, that's how long I'll get it. You see, as I told you, everything starts from one and then multiply into many. Everything must start with consciousness, nothing can be created without consciousness. You give me one single example in this universe which can be created without consciousness. One single example. Therefore, no chemical can create create consciousness for us, which is impossible. Because science says that there is a combination of chemicals inside carbon, protein, in the brain and then it will be consciousness. Then that combination disappears, you lose your consciousness. If that is the case, then we can create that combination which will elaborate and create consciousness. Can anything be created without consciousness tell me? Can you imagine anything being created without consciousness? Nothing. And everything which created first in the consciousness in the human mind. If I want to create this building, the idea must come into the human mind first. And that is the consciousness. Human mind is driven by consciousness. And that idea created the building. It is created first in non-existent form in the So the experience of Vedas about the creation of the universe is very simple and very scientific. And I tell you very simple language. There was pure consciousness everywhere, there was nothing else but the consciousness in the beginning. From that consciousness, the creator, the, the, the conscious, whoever is the creator, whatever name you give, it doesn't matter. The creator decided to create a material of creation, the first atomic, uh, atom of the creation, which is called in Sanskrit, it is called Mahatta. It is the element of the element, or atom of the atom, you can call it. That was the first atom created by the consciousness to create this universe. And then the second creation it did was because it is all uniform, like this is space. How do you create difference into that? To create difference, you have to embed difference in that. And that difference was created through what they call it ahem. Ahem is ego, that is, it is me. Specifically, it is not a uh, selected response. You see, the difference between him and me is created because it is me and he is you. This is how the difference is. And all other subjects. So that is the second element, the first element is the, the first autumn which is called Mahatma. The second element is the ahem, the ego which came into this element. And from that he created five elements, physical elements of this universe. <coughs> there are five physical elements. I tell sometimes that why do we have five fingers? There is very very reason for that. I will explain to you later on. The first creation is this empty space, we call it. It's called Akash. Because without this empty space, nothing can exist. You have to have a space to, to exist for anything. So the first creation is the space. And the space is connected. You see, human being is directly connected to the space. We are, that's why the human being is called a, a prototype of the entire universe. We have come past the other thing which is there in this universe. So the human being is connected to this space through our ears. 
or what we call the sense of hearing, each originating into the empty space, into the akash. All the sounds. And that's why I think in Bible also they say, first there was nothing but sound. In, in uh, Vedic knowledge they say there was nothing but sound, the whole world came from first. I think in, in uh, some other scriptures I read, there was nothing but sound existed. So the space was created, the whole empty vast space, if the property of the space is sound, and it is connected to our sense of hearing. The second element which came from space is the air, which exists everywhere there are in space. It is coexistent with the space. All entire space is filled with air. Now what variety of air does it fill the air? And that air is connected to our sense of touch. When the air blows you feel touch. That is directly related to our sense of touch. The third creation is the creation of fire, or you can call it energy. Sun is a symbol of fire, but sun is not fire. Fire is far more pervading than the sun. Sun is like a piece of wood which will exhaust once the fuel is exhausted. Once the wood is born, the sun is born, the sun will disappear. The fire will exist. Fire exists in unseen form, it exists everywhere. And that fire is connected to our sense of sight. The sun is the greatest symbol of sight. The, the, the fire, when the sun goes down, then this, your visibility goes down, then the night you can't see. It's directly connected to your sense of sight. So the human being is connected, and I'm explaining this how they're connected to the five elements of the nature. The fourth element of the nature is water from the fire. In fact, science also accepts that once upon a time, the earth was nothing but a ball of gas and then it converted into water and food, and then it became into water. So these last three parts of science accepts. So the water is the fourth element which was created from the fire. Fire gave birth to water. And water is connected to our sense of taste. Everything, every taste comes from water, nothing else. It's the basis of all the tastes. And the fifth is the solid element that is the earth, that is the fifth creation and this is connected to the sense of spirit, all the sense of the So these five elements are the, the entire physical universe. The entire physical universe consists of these five elements, nothing else. Everything physical which you see in this universe is consisting of these five elements, nothing else. That is very simple theory logic. There's nothing beyond that. In our body there's nothing but these five elements. Once we die, as I showed by showing to the dead man's body, we go back to these five elements. There's air in the body, there's energy in the body, or what you call electricity or fire. And then there is water in the body, there is earth, bodies in the body, and the space we go to the space. So this is the fundamental part of the case. Now how the consciousness came in, and this is only the physical. When you created the eye, but how I became intelligent? How the food we eat becomes intelligent? I drink this water, and inside the body it becomes into plants. It converts into flesh. What we drink and what we eat becomes our flesh and our you know, bones and our neurons and our blood, everything becomes so how it becomes inside. It's a great way. So the consciousness, how it came from? Now, the consciousness is that, as I was telling you, there is nothing but consciousness in the, in the universe, the entire universe, but nothing but consciousness. And then these five elements were created, and in order to create life, the universal consciousness, the supreme, whatever name you give, it doesn't matter. You may call him Christ, you may call him Amita, you may call him Brahma, you may call him whatever name you give. But the supreme power which has this consciousness decided to give this consciousness to each of them and giving these. Then a conception takes place, which is the semen and egg is together, but no conception is possible without entry of the consciousness at that particular moment. And that entry of the consciousness is decided by somebody else. And that is why the 
turns into a fetus and then the fetus grows and then we grow. You see, some people don't believe in consciousness. As I was telling you, some people say that uh, we are chemical combination and it comes from the consciousness comes from there. Now we all experience this thing every single day in our life, but we do not observe it properly. Or maybe we ignore it. What is consciousness? You see, in the evening you will go and sleep after your dinner. You will go into a dreamland. This world will not exist for you. This world will disappear. Completely not existent. You are lying in the bed. Your body is lying in the bed. But you exist. And in the dream you play all the role which you are doing here. You attend a conference, you eat your food, you talk to your friends, you fight with friends, you argue, then you, you do everything but you are doing in this time. How do you do that? Because you exist in the form of light. So every human being can exist in the form of light. This is what the dream that tells you. And you do exist in the form of light every single day. That is another form of consciousness. Consciousness has five forms. The first form is called waking state, which is this state where we can physically touch and see and everything. The second state is called dream state or in instance that they call it tejas state. Now in the tejas state you have this in the form of tejas, that is in the form of light. And you put everything in the form of light. You create a world in the form of light. Imagine the power of the world. The world. Every night you create a group of And then they, you come, you go into a deep sleep. That world also disappears. This world also disappears. You don't exist. Your own existence is not known to anybody to you. Somebody can come in your bedroom and take away everything you want. Hmm. Still you are alive. How? Your senses are not working, your mind is not working. How do I arrive? Because there is something called consciousness which is existing inside you. In that state. That is called pure consciousness. That is called pratyā. Pratyā avastha. The state of pratyā of consciousness. So that is the pure state of consciousness in which you are alive only because of consciousness. Otherwise you are dead. So that is the third state of consciousness. There are there is a fourth state in which you can be in this state and still reach the uh, what you call pure state of consciousness, that is called the uh, Kuriya state of uh, consciousness. And fifth state of consciousness is the universal consciousness, which I was talking about, the power behind the entire piece. So this is the uh, proof of existence of consciousness. And that consciousness exists in each one of us. And that is why when this consciousness leaves this body, we are dead. Nothing, the mind stops working, the senses stop working, the body stops working. Why? Because something leaves this body. When that thing leaves your body, everything stops. And that is the power behind your senses. And that is that consciousness is completely what we call insensible, we cannot sense it through our sense organs. It's not possible. Our sense organs are not designed for that because it is that power which enables your sense organs to see. So how can you see that power through your sense organs? It's not possible. So that power creates all this very species of life. This species of life the body is created with the five elements which acts on it. The consciousness comes from the, from the, the universal consciousness and that creates life. And all the properties of each species of plant, each species of uh, life, each species of human being comes from that. How they differentiate it simply, I can talk about that, but I think that I will not permit me to do so. so what I wanted to say is that, that we couldn't discover in the science, but in, if we can understand one, the property of one drop of water, 
and therefore we are all divine, we are part of the same divinity, and therefore we must recognize that that will create harmony, that will create love amongst ourselves. And that is the lesson which very rightly is teach, that once you understand that you and he have the same consciousness, how can you have actual consciousness? There's no way. So that's what they say that what you don't want for yourself, you don't need for others. Because they are all part of the divinity, they are all part of the and the whole mind. And that is where and the very message is. I would like to end here and I believe this is the way we are captivated the rest. Not because of the economic power, not because of any other power. I think it is Thank you very much.